So I will, in fact, uh, sort of talk about different things. So the title is generic, as you can see. Um, so today it will be mostly, well, exclusively actually, about uh, the physical diamonds. Um, but uh, not just the solid, solid state physics, but actually how to use diamonds as uh, uh, quantum sensors and also as quantum simulators. And uh, then tomorrow, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to talk about. We'll see how it goes today. Um, right, okay. So, well, before I start telling you about, uh, about this, these, these diamonds, and, um, I'd briefly like to tell you uh, the motivation why I am sort of interested in that, or at least why I'm interested in building a diamond sensor. And uh, that is, not surprisingly, biology. And um, so the, what you see here is sort of a, a cartoon of how biology has evolved. So this is how, I mean, well, biology in the early days, very early days, a few hundred years ago, was mainly concerned uh, with, with um, big objects like you and me and uh, things that you could see right, with your bare eyes. And uh, well, then uh, technology progressed. So at some point, uh, for example, a microscope uh, was invented. And that allowed you to resolve certain structures that you could not see with your bare eyes. And so you learned more about biology. I mean, so for example, in this case, I mean, this you could see by just opening someone's um, uh, And uh, then, but you, you, with the microscope, you could see that there are actually sort of a neural net underlying the brain. If you look at it more carefully, then you could see a, a, a neuron. And then if you invent uh, better uh, tools for investigating um, small structures like electron microscope or so, or various other techniques that you could you could resolve more and more the fine structure of all these biological uh, well, of all these substructures that you have in, in, in biology and so I mean I'm mainly showing this because uh, what, what this indicates is that we can learn more about biology by developing better tools for imaging things okay and um, those uh, if we work our way down at some point, quantum properties might become important. And um, so that might be in the end the, the really far, uh, really the goal. But uh, at the moment, what I want to show you is how one might conceivably build a, a detector or a sensor that uh, would have an extremely high <laughs> resolution. In fact, it's so precise that it might be able to sense an individual nuclear spin that is sitting somewhere in some biological material and uh, at a certain distance. And um, <coughs> that could open up a whole variety of you know, possibilities uh, for investigating biological systems in ways that are simply not possible at the moment. So, well, okay, and what we want to find out is sort of, well, I mean, in the end we would like to use this tool to determine structure, but also to follow the dynamics of such structure. So for example, we would like to find out how a protein is built up how it's composed, and also how it's changing in time. And we would like to be able to, to follow this dynamics. And if we can do that, then we will also really learn a lot about the function of those uh, proteins. And uh, we will learn how structure determines dynamics and how dynamics <coughs> determines function. Well, and as I said, for that, you need kind of new detectors. Um, but it's actually, to some extent, people can already uh, do such things. And uh, what they would do, for example, is the following. Um, so here you would have some piece of a protein. Yeah. And so people would like to make, for example, a distance measurement bet uh, between parts of the protein. And so what they would do is they uh, make little molecules, which we call sort of spin labels, and they carry, for example, an electron spin. And by some clever biological engineering and so on, they can make sure that they attach in a particular place in the protein. And so you do this here and here. And because they have two electron spins, these two electron spins will interact with each other by dipole-dipole interaction. <coughs> and dipole-dipole interaction depends on distance, like one over r cubed. 
<coughs> and so from the when you when if you are able to measure the interaction strength here, you can infer something about the distance between those electron spins. And uh, that's a perfectly acceptable uh, method. That's what people are actually using. And in principle, you could also try and follow now when, for example, this part of the protein starts to bend or so, then the distance between those two electron spins will change in time. And you might try and follow uh, this change of distance by seeing just how the interaction strength changes. And the interaction strength is just, I mean, expresses itself in terms of energy level shifts that you have in this system. And then you can measure this with uh, electron spin resonance, for example. So as I said, that's a, that's a great method, it works. Um, but it has one of the other shortcomings. So one is um, that uh, you actually have to do this on, a, on an ensemble. So you actually don't have just one protein, you have, uh, I don't know, 10 to the 9 or whatever, I mean, a lot. And that means not all the proteins are in exactly the same state and there's some sort of disorder and all this together leads to a sort of a limitation in the spatial resolution that you can actually achieve. Yeah, it's sort of, you know, and I mean, it's hard to go below sort of five nanometers or something like that. Five nanometers, however, is an enormous distance uh, in, in proteins. I mean, it's, this is like, you know, 20 atoms or something like that in between. So this is not single sort of atom resolution for sure. Um, so that's, that's certainly one, one problem. So you would like to have perhaps something that can make such measurements on an individual specimen. Okay. Because then you, you get rid of all sorts of inhomogeneous broadening and so on, and you, you could uh, probably reach a much higher uh, sensitivity. And the other thing is, if you, if you think about that, I mean, this is, this is um, well, you have to sort of stick something onto the protein. So these spin, spin markers have to be have to, have to be attached. Now, although these are relatively small, you can never be completely sure that uh, what you then observe is the natural behavior of the protein, or whether you're seeing something that, well, has been influenced by the fact that you're sticking something onto this uh, protein. So it would be nice to actually have perhaps a method where you do not have to stick anything on, uh, attach anything to this, to this protein at all. So you just take the protein or whatever other biological system you have, and you are still able to, to make <coughs> distance measurements and, and, uh, and follow maybe the dynamics of the protein. In a way, that's sort of the goal that you may be able in the end to achieve by <coughs> using these diamonds. And now I will tell you um, what the idea is are behind that. So this is what we're going to use, roughly. Um, so this is, uh, I've forgotten the name, it's a very famous diamond, so unbelievably expensive. Um, uh, in the last summer school I said this costs more than your average uh, lab equipment, but then I was told that lab equipment is very expensive, <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's probably not, uh, well, I don't know, but this will probably cost a few million. Anyway, so this is uh, this is a diamond. So this is um, basically um, well carbon, yeah, in a nice regular lattice. And when you look at this, actually, it's basically transparent, and it's transparent because the band gap is about five and a half or some electron volt or something like that. So you, I mean, light just goes through. Right? And so if you really would have a pure pure diamond. Um, well, then it would look roughly like this, and it would be ra really not very useful for us. So fortunately, um, nature has kindly provided us with um, um, not only pure crystals, but actually they also tend to have defects. And so this is uh, Frank, who was a, was a crystallographer, and he said crystals are like people, it's, uh, it's only the defects that, that make them interesting. And this is certainly true in diamonds here. So what you actually see down here is also diamonds. And as you can see, they are colored. And they are colored because they contain defects in their crystal structure. And uh, these defects are optically active. So that means when sort of they might absorb, for example, at a particular frequency, or they may re-emit light at a particular frequency. And that makes the diamond color. And so it's exactly these kind of defects that we want to 
use for our purposes here. Right? And um, the fact that they are colored and therefore react to also the absorbing emit light is already a first uh, bonus that we have because we can take a laser, shine it onto this defect, and therefore can make, for example, great resonance fluorescence. And this will allow us, in the end, to measure the internal state of such a defect. And so that will be very useful in the end. But we need more than that. So there are about, f at, well, there are loads of <coughs> defects, but there are about 500 that are sort of reasonable, at least roughly characterized. Okay, so many, many, many different effects. And there's one that is extremely popular. And um, I'll tell you why that is. So this is um, so-called NV um, color center. And what is this? So th well, here you see these, these gray spheres here. These are carbon atoms. And then you see that in the lattice, one carbon atom has been replaced by a nitrogen atom. And then next to it, on the neighboring uh, lattice side, uh, one carbon atom has been knocked out. And it's just it's left empty this side. And so that is basically, that is what we call an NV color center. And uh, we call it a color center because, well, I mean, it reacts to visible, uh, visible light. It um, has a resonance frequency of something like 630 nanometers or something like that. And um, so this actually uh, appears naturally in diamond. So in, in, even this one will contain a few of these uh, NV color centers. I mean, it's just that it's so pure that it contains relatively few of them, so you don't really see them. AI, but if you would really look for them, you would probably also find some in this, in this large, large line. Okay, so what is nice about that is that in many respects, that behaves like a little atom. And um, it will have an optical transmission. Well, that is at 637 nanometers. And um, that you can use to read out information from it. It also has an electron spin, so if you go down here to the ground state, then you will see actually that, uh, that you have actually two electrons that are paired up to give a spin one. And so you have, uh, well, the m equals zero state is down here, and then you have the m equals plus and minus one states up here, and they are naturally split by an amount of 2.8 gigahertz. Uh, and so what you can do here is you can take a uh, um, a microwave radiation, shine it onto this defect, and you can manipulate this electron spin. So you have another thing, another little handle that you can actually turn and you can, man can manipulate. And the nice thing is, because you have a slit in here, then you, you can imagine that if I choose the frequency of the, uh, the excitation of the laser here just right, then I can excite it selectively uh, depending on whether the system is in this state or in that state. So I can read out the state of the electron spin. So that's that's a neat thing. And uh, if you do the same in, 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 in ion traps, um, it's the same thing. Um, but here, of course, this is not sitting in ultra high vacuum, but it's actually held in a crystal lattice. Right. So that's um, kind of a kind of a neat thing because I mean what you could do or what you can do actually is you if you take this diamond, you find where there's an NV center, so you make a little mark also roughly to, to know where it is, and you take the diamond, you drop it accidentally, you pick it up again, the NV center will be in exactly the same place. It is not, just not moving. I mean, it's extremely stable at room temperature, so you actually have to make the diamond very hot to, to make these things sort of start and, and diffuse and so on. The activation energy for hopping from one point in the lattice to another one is, is quite large, as you can imagine. Diamond is an extremely hard material, and so therefore you have, it's, it's very hard to move atoms around in there. So this is uh, kind of a nice feature. So on the one hand, you have here a system that uh, in many respects, it will behave like an atom in free space, but it is held in a, in a solid state device. Now, of course, you can say, well, okay, it's not quite like an atom in free space because uh, atoms in ion traps or ions in ion traps have extremely long lifetimes. And, um, that's true, and their actual lifetimes are much longer than uh, for, for this NV center here. But the, these lifetimes here are remarkably long. So an electron spin state can have a lifetime of um, about eight milliseconds or so, which is actually pretty good, and it's in a solid state. <coughs> and uh, so that's, 
that's sort of a nice, uh, nice, nice feature. So you have long lifetimes of your quantum information that you can put in there, and uh, you don't have to put uh, do so much effort to to keep the, the quantum system where it is. And in fact, you can actually think of also moving the diamond, and with it, you will move your little MD center close to two places that you want to measure. <coughs> so how would you measure things? Well, actually, for an electron spin, the spin splitting here, uh, that's how the energy splitting between the different um, m equals zero, plus or minus one, say, will of course depend on the magnetic field. You put an electron spin in the magnetic field, and spin up and spin down will have a different energy. And so the splitting here, will certainly depend on what magnetic field is acting locally at the position of this MB center. So you can immediately see that this could, in principle, make a magnetic field sensor. Yeah. Now the question is, how precise can it be? So what kind of magnetic fields can you actually measure here? How, how small can they be uh, that they might still be uh, detectable? And that's exactly what um, sort of what I want to, want to show you. I mean, if you don't do any tricks, then you cannot measure very small uh, magnetic fields. But with sort of various tricks and quantum optics methods and so on that I will show you, um, it is actually quite conceivable that you can measure the field, the magnetic field that is generated by an individual nuclear spin that is sitting five nanometers away from this MB center. And uh, if you have that, then what I will show you that in principle you might be able to use this to make measurements of nuclear spins in biological proteins. So that sort of that will be sort of a roadmap. But this cannot be just done like putting this device together, putting it there, and then somehow measuring the uh, the, the, the the frequency shift in the electron spin here. You have to play some some tricks. So. But uh, what I first want to show you is very briefly to convince you that this is actually a quantum system, an individual quantum system that you can that you have in this um, in this diamond. So what people have done a long time ago already is that they have okay, they had a diamond, they were looking for an individual MB center. So they take a basically what they take a microscope or so, and um, so then they irradiate this individual nuclear, uh, this individual um, MB center by a laser. So they take this 637 nanometer light or, or whatever else comes handy. They shine in this laser onto this individual um, MB center and then they look at the resonance fluorescence. Okay. And um, then they look at the photon statistics of the light that has been scattered. And uh, so they want to sort of uh, show that this is an individual MV center that they're exciting and it behaves like a quantum system. So one indication for that is actually that, so you shine in the laser, you excite the, uh, this MV center, and then it drops down again, it emits a single, it emits a photon, and then flies into your detector. So your detector sees, for example, this, this photon. And now the question is, how likely is it that you see another photon a little time tau later, okay. and um, well, here this is this is plotted basically. It's an intensity correlation function. So here you look at the um, at the time delay. So actually, so for this time delay, so you see at no time delay, it's a very small probability that you see another photon. Then it rises. Then the probability goes down again, and it oscillates. And this is basically due to this these oscillations here, due to Rabi oscillations in the system, so coherent oscillation. And the fact that at zero time delay, uh, you don't see any, you don't see a second photon right away, basically, indicates to you that this is an individual quantum system. Right. And so this is an experiment that was done, and actually, this is a way how how people, I mean, they they also. Uh, they look for MV centers, so they shine light on them, and then they look at intensity correlation functions to see whether they really have, in their focal spot, they only have a single MV center, or whether they have many. Okay. And um, now the other thing is, which is also kind of nice to have, one, one method is 
to, I mean, so you, you take the diamond and you look, is there an NV center? And you search for them. And that's how people often do that at the moment. That's fine, I mean, you actually find NV centers very quickly, that's not a problem. Now, if you want to build a quantum computer with that, for example, then you would like to find uh, maybe another NV center quite close by. Okay, so then you will go around and uh, you, will, you look through the diamond and um, actually occasionally you will find such a situation where the two NV centers are just a 10 nanometers apart from each other. But the probability for that is already not so high anymore. And in fact, there are not very many diamonds in the world whereby by randomly you, people have found uh, two NV centers that are sufficiently close to maybe a couple of them to be close. <coughs> right. And now you can imagine what's going to happen when I ask for three that are close together. Well, the probability goes down very rapidly, and it's very unlikely that you find that. And if you want to have five or ten or so, you can forget about it. So what you have to be able to do is you have to find ways of making these NV centers in a controlled way. Okay. And so there are various ways. I mean, the standard way at the moment is uh, if you really want to do that. So uh, if you want to do it regularly, you put a mask and then you send in ion beams of nitrogen, for example, and it goes through the holes in the mask, and uh, then they, the nitrogens, they, they hit the diamond, they lose their velocity, I mean, they're slowed down, and they make a random walk in the crystal lattice, and then they end up somewhere. And uh, that's fine, but you, it's very hard to get to really small different distances. And so there's a really neat way that um, is sort of in the process of being uh, developed, and that actually uses <coughs> ion trap technology. Yeah. And um, what it does is, roughly speaking, that's the plan, and to some extent it's, it's working. So imagine you have here uh, a linear ion trap, just like you have seen uh, this morning. And so in here you have a crystal of ions that is laser cooled to its molten ground state. So that means already that the weight packet of these, each of these ions is whatever, I, I don't know exactly, 20, 30 nanometers or something like that in extent. So you already have, in this way, you have uh, sort of localized the atoms to, uh, I mean, 20, 30 nanometers. Okay, so this, what you would like to have is here, you would like to have nitrogen ions in here, and so they can be trapped and, and cooled. And then what you do is, well, you have here, if you, if you have here these, these electrodes here, you, if you slice them into small pieces, then you can actually control each one of these individually, and what you can do is you can accelerate the ions out of the trap. So it's like an ion gun, so you shoot the ion in one particular direction. And the neat thing is, if you can control the electrodes very carefully, then you not only accelerate the ions in a particular direction, you can actually also apply kind of a focusing force so that when they reach the surface of the diamond, the spatial resolution is actually much, much better than just these 30 nanometers that you had at the beginning. So I'd like that you try to sort of focus down on a spot. And in that way, it's quite conceivable that you, could, that you can get a very high spatial resolution that is certainly enough to implant them at roughly different distances of 5 to 10 nanometers. And that's what you certainly would need if you would like to use uh, NV centers um, uh, as, as sort of a you know, uh, constructed quantum system with which to build a, a quantum simulator. It's also useful to have that if you want to just implant a single one and you want to impl implant it close to the surface. Right? Because uh, you, when you look through a diamond, you may not just find it very close to the surface. So you would like to be able to make this. So that's, um, well, so that's uh, done uh, by a uh, sort of work that is uh, in, in progress by Kilian Singer and Karin schmidt Kala in Mainz. And they're really working towards, uh, towards this. Right, but now, okay, so this, this was just to show you that, well, we don't have to rely on, on randomness here, so we can actually really plant these things, they behave like individual quantum systems. I didn't show you plots on the various lifetimes, but this sort of this many degrees of freedom lived for quite a while. And so um, the device that you would now dream of uh, is the following. So here you have the you have an atomic force, uh, the tip of an atomic force microscope. This is really only there in the end to, to hold the diamond in place and move it around with very high uh, precision in space. 
And then you could imagine that you stick a tiny, tiny diamond, a nanometer-sized diamond, at the tip of this uh, AFM here. And this nanometer-sized diamond contains an MD central. Okay. So how you do this in detail uh, is, well, it, it can be done. Yeah. And now you also you use this to move around this diamond and bring it, for example, close to a piece of biological material or some spin in a solid state system or something like, something that you want to measure. Okay. And you have to be you have to be quite close. So I said, well, I mean, a few nanometers is really what you want to achieve. Um, but that's not a problem. Well, not a problem is not quite the right word. But I mean, you can do this with with this AFM. And so there are some sort of basic demonstrations where you can where you can show that in principle you can use this MV center and these as a as a magnetometer, but um, these experiments were not nearly precise enough to to actually really measure an individual uh, nuclear spin or anything like that. But uh, they were really nice uh, experiments to show that in principle something like that can be done. Okay, so what are the obstacles? Well, you know the obstacles here. Um, uh, well, it's, it's quite clear. One is, well, a nuclear spin has a very small magnetic moment and therefore generates a very small magnetic field. It, this is nanotesla, so at, at a distance of five nanometers, so really quite a small field. Okay. Um, so you have to actually measure a long time. But measuring a long time is actually not such a nice thing to do here because, well, I mean, uh, this spin is sitting somewhere in the diamond. There's always a bit of noise around. So there will actually be magnetic field fluctuations, and the diamond contains carbon-13. Carbon-13 itself has a nuclear spin. And so this nuclear spin will also interact with your sensor, and uh, there are quite a few carbon-13s in fact, and so you, you will actually get some noise. And so the longer you wait, also the stronger the, the noise uh, can, can have. Another thing is that so you have all this magnetic noise around you, and so you have to find a way of, on the one hand, getting rid of this noise, perhaps, and on the other hand, still remaining sensitive to this one tiny magnetic uh, moment that is sitting somewhere outside of the diamond. And uh, in the end, one would also actually try and measure very, very small changes in position, like angstrom size changes in position, because actually, such tiny changes in uh, the configuration of a, of a protein, for example, can have quite significant consequences on its behavior in, in some cases. And so you would like to be able to have such a resolution. Well, if you want to do that, there are two ways. So one is the hardware approach. This is what experimentalists do. They will, well, they make their system as clean as possible. So for example, you take the diamond and you make an isotope pure diamond, or at least you try and reduce the number of carbon 13s in the diamond so that there are no nuclear spins of that kind uh, lying around. Then you clean the surface of those diamonds because surfaces are usually quite uh, problematic areas. There's all sorts of dirt and things change there all the time and fluctuate, and this is not a very good, a good thing to have. And so you can actually uh, make all sorts of treatments of the, of the surface. And okay, so these are all sort of things that you can do uh, to improve the quality of the system. That's fine, and that's what one certainly has to do. But, um, well, you can only go so far. You cannot make things absolutely pure, carbon-12, for example. You cannot clean the surface completely. And it, the worst is, if you want to make measurements in a biological system, uh, then there's all sorts of stuff around. Biology is not so clean. There's water around. Uh, water has dipoles, they will fluctuate, they create noise. Yeah. And so there's always a certain amount of noise that is there, and that noise you have to attack in other ways. And so let's say it's called a software approach. So you try and find clever tricks by using radiation to protect your system from noise, to make it insensitive to noise. So this is not by creating, changing the diamond structure or so, but actually by using radiation from the outside. And so what I would like to show you is some sort of quantum optics kind of tricks that achieve that. It's a general principle actually that is useful in a wide range of things going from, well, sensors here, but also involving, I mean, uh, also be useful, for example, for quantum computers. 
because quantum computers uh, also have to be protected from all sorts of elements from the environment. Okay, so that's what I what I want to start with. So I I want to show you a little bit what is so how one could build such a sensor that is protected against uh, noise from the environment. And so from now on, I want to forget about uh, that there is a diamond and I forget about the lattice and all these sort of things. And I just talk about the electron spin that is sitting in this ND center, right? So you don't need to know any, you don't need to know, remember any solid state physics or so. This is, this sounds now like atomic physics in fact. So you have here your m equals zero state, that is the one at the bottom. Then you have an m equals one state, that is the one higher up, and they are separated by about 2.8 gigahertz or so. And then you have another state, the ms equals minus one, and you split those two by applying a small magnetic field, static magnetic field that you just apply to the system. And then the plus state moves up, the minus state moves down, and then you have a clean two-level system. And it's not strictly necessary to do this, but uh, it makes the explanations now a lot simpler. Right, so this, this, these two levels, they in the end will form your little magnetic field sensor. And so in the end, we would like to um, measure um, whether the electron is sitting here or whether it's sitting here, and what is the energy difference between those two spins. So, okay, what might be the problem? Well, the problem is, of course, that this is a magnetically sensitive state. It has to be because we want to measure a small magnetic field. But that means that all sorts of fluctuating uh, fields in the environment will actually make this level jiggle up and down. Yeah, randomly. And so that means that the energy difference between spin down and spin up is not so well defined, so we have a certain line width, and that limits our uh, uh, resolution that we can possibly have. Okay. And so this is the effect that we have to fight. So this, this random fluctuations of the energy level, or in other words, the random fluctuation of the relative phase of some quantum state, a quantum state, a quantum superposition between ground and exact. So we have to somehow uh, fight that problem. So how do we do this? So as I said, first you clean everything as much as possible, and now you have to use some other methods. And uh, so there's something, so most of the things that I'm gonna tell you about, actually they're very well known, they're 50 years old. Uh, they're all used in NMR. Um, but the nice thing is that one can translate them to these systems, and then they become rather useful for this, for this kind of sensor. So what the thing, that one is using here is called dynamical decoupling. Okay. And so what this means is we use radiation to manipulate the system in such a way that it becomes insensitive to noise. And so how would that work? So I'll explain you the principle of that. And um, so, I mean, there are many ways of explaining this. So, I mean, at the moment I'll kind of like this one. Um, so it's a minimum amount of equations. One can, of course, do a lot of mathematics around that, but the principle can come clear from this. So imagine here, um, so it's not, well, these ones are black and these ones are gray. So the black ones are mirrors, and the gray uh, things here are beam splitters that let horizontally polarized light just go through, and vertically polarized light is just reflected off. So imagine we have such a, such a little uh, device here. So here is a beam splitter, here is a beam splitter, and here are the two, two, two mirrors, and I send in uh, um, photon, which is prepared in a superposition of horizontal plus vertical polarization. So, so I send this in, so then it's split, so here's the horizontal polarization propagates along this path, vertical polarization propagates along that path, and here they are united again and they propagate together. And so, well, if this is a real device, then it might well be that actually up here there is a bit of air, uh, slightly fluctuating refractive index, which will actually lead to a small phase change of this part of the wave function. And uh, if you don't know that, then what the effect is that, well, okay, here is a phase change, so the light that is propagating here is now e to the i phi t, horizontal polarization plus vertical polarization, and if you don't know how much big the phase change was, so you don't know whether there was a lot of air or just a little bit, so you don't know the refractive index, don't know the phase change, then you have to average over it. 
and that leads to a loss of coherence. Okay. And so you have a problem here. So you have to somehow um, try and correct uh, for this. And so one way is, uh, that's what David mentioned uh, earlier, is sort of error correction. Yeah. And then you encode, you use redundant encoding, and uh, you use with several photons, you send them through the device, and uh, then you do some complicated quantum operations afterwards, and then you can actually recover the, uh, the correct state. But this is actually quite, a, quite an effort, because you have to have several quantum systems, you have to control them. It would be nice to do something else that is perhaps easy. <laughs> and so one way you could do is, imagine that this is, you know, it's some, some unknown value, but it's fixed in time. I mean, so it's, it's really one phase factor that is imposed. So if we have that, then why don't we do the following? We have, so we have propagated the, the light through this device, so we have this state, and now we flip horizontal and vertical polarization, or at least we try to, so now. And so we end up with this state. So H and G is, is, is split, so we have H plus E to the N phi. And now we take this photon and send it through the same device again. Yeah. And now the horizontal part of the wave function uh, of the photon will uh, take the upper part, picks up again a phase factor of e to the i phi, and the lower part doesn't get any phase. So we go through, and what we end up in the end is now e to the i phi, so this phase, times h plus v. So now what was a relative phase before has become a global phase, and a global phase is not a problem. If you make any kind of measurement here or on this state, you will get exactly the same result. Any observable will give the same result. And so this is uh, sort of a neat little trick by which you can actually get rid of the influence of such a phase change as long as it's always the same phase change. So you run through the device twice and you basically have undone the, the error. So that's fine. Um, now let's see what actually happens when this phase change does depend on time. So every time you run through the device, you get a slightly different phase change. Okay. Oops, ah, oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so we will see that in a moment. So what I'll show you here is now a little thing that I took from Wikipedia, I think. Um, it shows the same principle with spins. So what we will do is, the spin will first be rotated from spin up uh, in that direction to uh, spin pointing in x direction. Then uh, I will show different examples. Each of those sees a slightly different phase, so they will start to, I mean, slightly different uh, oscillation frequency, so they sl start to pick up a, a relative phase. And that means they move in the xy plane. And then after a while, we make a flip, so what before was a flip between horizontal and vertical polarization is here a flip between spin up and spin down, and then we will see that everything recovers again. So that's, that's what we will see. So here, so you start to sort of, you know, the phase of randomizer, so you walk in the xy plane, and now you kick the system, you make a phase change, and now you see that the ones that were running ahead are now picking up, uh, uh, are slower, and the ones that have fallen behind are faster. And so at some moment in time, they exactly rephase again. Yeah. So that, that, that is sort of, a, you know, sort of an infinite loop. So it shows this uh, again and again. But it's exactly the same principle, but now this time it spins. And this is exactly what uh, Hahn in 1950 actually proposed, and it's called a Hahn yeah. um, Right, and so then, so now they have rephased, and then you, you should stop your experiment and then you see um, Okay, so now let's see. Um, so Han was also assuming, okay, so we just have some kind of, you know, frequency mismatch or so, so it's constant in time, and so with this little trick of flipping, we can we can actually correct. So now here, um, let's do the same thing. So again with this sort of with a photon example, but now here we have a, a let's say a frequency that is actually fluctuating in time. And so then the overall phase that is being picked up is e to the i integral over this, this frequency. Okay, so we have here this phase that we pick up. Then we go through the device, photon comes out, we flip h and v, 
we go through the same device again, but now it doesn't pick up exactly the same phase factor because really this, this, this frequency is fluctuating in time. So what comes out now is not just the global phase, but there's still some relative phase left, which is the, just the phase difference between what has been picked up here and what has been picked up here. So it seems that, well, I mean, we haven't really gained uh, so much because um, mostly when you have an environment, frequencies are fluctuating randomly, and so here you have not protected against this, this random fluctuations. But now let's see what we can do to actually remedy that situation too. And so this is the pretty much the only calculation in the entire talk. Um, so um, let's have a look. So this is this relative phase that we get. So we have an integral here. This is the frequency, which depends on time, and it's integrated and, uh, from t to two t, and here's from zero. So these two, ideally they should be equal, then they will cancel off and we will have no relative phase, but we cannot expect that they're exactly equal. So what now? Let's sort of uh, look at a special type of environments, namely the ones where the frequency might be changing, but it doesn't change very rapidly. And that will actually often be the case in, in real realistic environments. And so what, let's, let's do the following. We have phi of s. If it's a slowly changing function of time, then I can simply expand it to first order, to make a Taylor expansion. So phi of naught plus s times, well, the first derivative of that frequency. And I do the same in the second integral. And so here we have a constant contribution, and that will cancel off exactly. And the only thing that is left is this time derivative times s. And so now you compute this integral. That's not very difficult. So it's a linear function integrated over time interval. So that's proportional to t squared, basically. And well, that's the that's the really the outcome here. So you have something that's the phase that is left over that is proportional to t squared times the derivative of the change of the, of, of, the, of the frequency. So, um, okay, so when t is small, then this phase is actually quite small. And so this we can now use by, um, instead of making just one of these Hahn echoes, so we have a long time interval, and halfway in between we make this, this flip from between h and v, what we actually do is we take this long time interval and slice it into many, many small pieces. So. Um, we take a zero interval from zero to capital T, and we slice it into n equally long pieces. Right, and for each of these intervals, we do our little trick with the with the Hahn echo. So we, we make a flip halfway through, and so what we will find is in each of these intervals, you pick up a phase that is e to the i times the derivative of the frequency multiplied with the square of the length of the interval, so that is capital T divided by n. Yeah. Well, in each of those intervals you pick up this phase, so you get n times this phase altogether. Yeah? And so in the end, the overall phase that you get, and you make in each of these intervals, you make a little harmonic is t squared divided by n times the derivative. And so when you send n to infinity, then this phase goes to zero, or if e to the i to the, of this phase goes to one. So what this tells you is that if you just apply these, these you know, pi passes sufficiently rapidly, then you can protect against the influence of some environment, even though, I mean, it's effected sort of non-constant. And so this is exactly what you want to use now. So you make a rapid sequence of these pi pulses, and in this way, you protect your system against environment fluctuations. And so that's exactly the strategy. And, um, well, that's great, so we do this, so we send uh, pulses in. If, if uh, I mean, as we know, the more the pulses, the better, so we might take a few like this, each of those is a pi pulse. Um, if we need more, uh, we take more, so we make uh, more frequently, we apply pi pulses, and uh, you can do this more and more frequently if you like. And, um, that's a perfectly acceptable recipe, and that's exactly what is used in NMR, for example, to protect your molecules against influence from, from the uh, environment. And that's very successful, and that's actually really exactly the right thing to do in, in, in NMR. Um, 
Right. So uh, let's see. So you could do this also in NV samples, and it's actually being used uh, also for NV samples to protect them against noise. So, um, well, um, right. That's one. Okay. So that's great. But of course, then you have to apply lots of pulses in very short time intervals, and have to be equally spaced and so on. You start at some point to develop problems. A, you actually have to control the timing quite well. So, I mean, the higher the pulse rate, the harder it gets for you to control everything. Each of these pulses should make a full pi rotation, for example, of your spin. But the time interval, of course, in which you can do this pi rotation has to become shorter and shorter if you want to have more and more pulses. So your source has to become more and more intense. So that's a problem on the one hand from a, well, theoretical point of view. I mean, things like the rotating wave approximation might actually break down at some point. And they have pushed this in these experiments so far that they actually see that. And so then your theoretical analysis doesn't really apply anymore and uh, you don't, you introduce actually extra errors that you actually want to protect against. You can have off-resonant excitations and all sorts of stuff like that. Those are sort of theoretical problems. You can see them in experiment, but a much worse ex real practical problem is actually that to create this radiation, you have to really make tiny sort of structures that create this, this microwave radiation. And so you have to put, uh, you know, you have to put more and more power into those, and they are quite small, and at some point they burn. And uh, so really, I mean, there's a certain limit to the power that you can put in. And so clearly, what you would like to do is you would like to somehow avoid that uh, you have a very, very high peak power, which really destroys your structures. And uh, so you would like to somehow distribute your intensity in the most equal way possible. So how do you do that? Well, why not get rid getting rid of the pulses and replace them by a constant field? So gaps in between, so you distribute your energy uh, a little bit more evenly. And in fact, uh, what we've sort of shown is that ener if energy consumption is one of your constraints, then this is the best way to do this. Yeah. So if, you, if, you only, if your structures only survive a certain amount of power that you put in, then really you would like to have a constant field applied, and that gives you the best error protection for per unit power. So that's a completely non-trivial theorem that's actually very hard to prove, but in principle you can do that. And uh, so now the question of course to some extent is, so why did the NMR people use this? Yeah. What is the reason for that? Well, in NMR what you have is you don't do experiments on a single system. You actually take a, a whole ensemble of spins and not all of them have the same resonance frequency. And so what you want to dis discouple all of them from the environment. So what you want is that all of them are driven by your decoupling scheme, so by the fields that you are applying. And because you have a certain spread in frequency, your field should have a certain spread in frequency. And pulses automatically have, I mean, they are, well, a pulse means in Fourier spectrum you have a certain width. And so by applying pulses, you actually will address the entire ensemble. And so therefore, this is really probably the right thing to do in NMR. Um, but here we don't have an ensemble. Here we have an individual spin that we have well characterized, <coughs> and we know exactly where it's sitting in frequency space. So there's no need for this sort of pulsing to cover all the frequency space. We know exactly where we want to be, and so therefore this is probably the better strategy. So that's actually was not clear to me at the beginning myself, but then after, I mean, when we asked ourselves the question, why, why the hell did the NMR people first place uh, that it became clear to us. Because of course this constant, this, this kind of decoupling scheme is also known. In fact, uh, when I gave this talk recently, and there was Sarja Bosch who was in the, in, the, in the audience, and he sort of said, well, but uh, you know, Felix Bloch in 1950X or so, um, already sort of knew that, and, um, and he's right. But there's a good reason why people have not used this. So, but now, what is not completely clear, actually, why does it work? 
because now the, it's not a pi pulse that I apply, I have some continuous radiation. So why is it still protecting against fluctuations in the environment? And uh, so there are various ways of seeing this, and the nicest way, well, the simplest way, let's say, for me, is the following. So what do we do here? So we have our spin system, m equals zero, m equals one, and we drive it now on resonance with our, our microwave field. Well, if you have such a setting, well, you have a two-level system, you drive it on resonance with, with a field, then the best thing is you go to uh, the, the eigenstates of that system to argue further. Okay, so you get dress states, so you have a state that is a coherent superposition of zero and one, that's the upper one, and a coherent superposition of zero minus uh, the m equals one state, and that's the, that's the lower energy state. And these two dress states are separated from each other uh, by an amount that is just proportional to the Rabi frequency of the driving field here. That's proportional to the square root of the intensity. And so you can actually control the splitting here by the intensity with which you're driving. Okay. So why does that help? Now, let's think again. So here we are making sort of random energy fluctuations. So that means actually we are imposing a random phase. So the relative phase between zero and one is being changed in time. What does that mean here? Well, if you change the relative phase from minus to plus, we make a transition from here to here. So what in the original picture is a phase fluctuation, in this stress state picture is actually an amplitude fluctuation. So you try and go from the ground state to the upper state or from the upper state to the ground state. Well, that costs you energy. There's an energy difference between those two. Okay. So if you want to go from here to here, somehow the noise from the environment has to have, well, it's fluctuating in time, it has to have a frequency component that actually matches exactly this gap. <coughs> yeah. Because the energy for going from the ground to the inside state has to come from somewhere, and the only place is the environment. And so, in practice, um, environments often are rather slow, so they're fluctuating quite slowly. When you take the Fourier transform of that get a spectrum, and you see that dominantly the frequency in the environments are actually quite low. Yeah? And so they, for low frequencies, there might not be very much, and they go over a maximum, and then you go to higher frequencies, so then the sort of the numbers of frequencies or the intensity goes down. And so for high frequencies, you have very few fluctuations, for low frequencies, you have more. And so if you drive hard enough, if it's such that the energy difference here is so large that there's simply no fluctuations in the environment, then you are decoupled. Then there's no energy for you to make these transitions and the system just stays unaffected. So that's really, that's sort of the, the is, is another explanation for why this decoupling works. And so now what we do is we just shine this radiation on the system sufficiently hard that we are protected. And uh, the system becomes immune to any influence from the environment. Unfortunately, including anything that we wish to measure. Yeah. So, in a way, we have defeated ourselves now. We made a system that interacts with nothing. <laughs> right. Um, so, obviously, this cannot be quite the, the end of the, of, the, of the whole story. There's one other thing, and again, we just look what NMR people tend to do in these cases, and um, and we, we, we steal a trick from them. And um, that is simply the following. What we want to measure is a magnetic, uh, is, a, is a spin in the environment. And the spin can point down and it can point up. And so we can apply a magnetic field to the whole probe, such that the spin down and the spin up state of this spin that we want to see has a certain energy difference. And we choose it such that the We choose it such that, it, that the energy difference of the spin up and spin down matches exactly the difference of the energy difference of the two uh, dress states. So now you have a resonance condition. So if, um, if there's some kind of interaction now between these, these spins, so the electron spin in the MV center and the spin in the outside world, because they are resonant, you can imagine that they really exchange energy with each other. So what is the interaction? Well, 
they are, they are spin, so they have a dipole-dipole interaction, so they will automatically interact with each other. And if this energy splitting just is matched here exactly, then they will really, you, you can really see a strong um, exchange of energy between the electron spin and the nuclear spin. And so this is called Hartmann-Hahn condition. So that's a sort of a neat trick that's from 1962, as you can see from the slides. And this is another thing that you have to use in addition. So on the one hand, what you're doing is you're, you're driving your spin in such a way that it's decoupled from everything that you don't want to see. And then you tune the one thing that you want to see on resonance with this driven spin. And that's also in quantum optics, I mean, this is the principle of a lock-in amplifier. So it's a similar, similar idea, actually. Um, right. Okay, so how would that look? So what would you do? So now, um, we, oops, yeah, that's the interaction. So what we would start with is we would take the electron spin and by using the laser light, we would actually polarize uh, the, the electron spin. So we make optical pumping so that in the end, the, the electron spin is pointing downwards, for example. And um, so now let's see if that's the case, or we actually do it in such a way that the system is in this, in this lower dress state here. And let's say the, this, the nuclear, so the spin, the nuclear spin or the electron spin in the environment is actually in this spin upstate. What will happen now? Well, they're interacting, so they will exchange energy. And so they make flip-flops going back and forth uh, in time. So they energy goes into the electron spin and goes out and goes back. And so this exactly this interaction you can now measure. You can actually wait a little while and then you check whether your electron spin actually has gone down from spin down, has gone from spin down to spin up or not. And if it has gone to spin up, then this indicates that there was something in the environment that it was interacting with. Then you can ask yourself, well, how quickly is it going, is it oscillating between spin, between spin up and spin down? And that tells you something about how strongly this electron spin is interacting with something on the outside, and the interaction strength depends on distance, and therefore we can infer something about the distance. Also, this is a hyperfine interaction, so the strength of this interaction will also depend on the relative orientation of the magnetic field that is applied, and the, X, the, the line joining the electron spin and the nuclear spin. And so you can also learn something about the relative angle between those two, um, uh, between the magnetic field and the line joining them. And so that, in the end, can allow you to t figure out, is there a spin over there near the camera? And how far away is the spin, basically? So how far away is this camera? So that you can, all this you can infer from this information of how quickly you, you oscillate back and forth. And um, uh, yes. And so now you have to put in numbers because this is, you know, this is completely theoreticians talk, completely general. Um, now you have to see how precise you can actually be. And I mean, as I said at the beginning, I would like to convince you that in principle you can see it in a single nuclear spin. So, we, that means Jan Ming Kai, we uh, did, the, did the calculations. And so we took a particular acid, phosphoric acid here. And so there's a phosphorus atom inside. And we took phosphorus A because it has a nice large magnetic moment, so easier to see. And also it appears in some um, in, in biological systems as well. So it's a reasonable thing to look at. And so we assume, okay, this phosphoric acid molecule is five nanometers away, roughly, from our nuclear, uh, from our ND center. And so in reality, this would probably mean in the first experiment, you would take a tiny, tiny diamond, and you just put the phosphoric acid on the surface of the diamond, and then you measure. And then you say, okay, so now we apply the strategy that we have been using, and we should be able to, for example, figure out where in space is this phosphoric this phosphorus atom. And what we sh should see is we, what we will do now is we wait a little moment, so we see whether there's energy exchange, and for certain directions in space, so that means for certain magnetic field orientations, you should see a very strong uh, signal, and for others you shouldn't see very much. And that's what we got when, when John Ming got, did the calculation. Well, it's not working, right? 
so not at all, right? Uh, this is completely, this is more or less a random um, um, picture here that you get. Because we have forgotten something. What have we forgotten? Well, hydrogen contains, well, has a nuclear spin. So this nuclear spin will interact with a phosphorus atom, uh, with a phosphorus nuclear spin. And because it's so very, very close, it's only about one and a half angstrom away, this interaction is actually stronger than the interaction of the phosphorus nuclear spin with the electron spin. So now remember, electron spin will interact a thousand times stronger with a nuclear spin than a nuclear spin with, this, so with the same nuclear spin, roughly a thousand times, because just the, the magnetic field is much stronger. But here the distance, of course, is much smaller. So these, these hydrogens are about 10, well, 30 times closer to the phosphorus than our little detector is. And so interaction strength decreases cubically with the distance. So 30 to the power of 3 is about 27,000. And so this easily beats um, the, 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 the smaller interaction strength between the two spins. And so what we have to do actually, well, we have to play the same trick again. We have to decouple these hydrogen atoms from the phosphorus atom. So we have to address, we have to shine in radio frequency to make these hydrogen atoms oscillate, uh, sort of make high rotations all the time or continuously rotating, and thereby the interaction with the phosphorus averages out and it goes away. And if you do this, then you see that. And now you really see that in certain direction you actually do have a little nuclear spin sitting and you can figure out where it is to a reasonable precision and uh, you can also work out its distance. So that's the principle, so to speak, at, at, at work now and uh, that looks like it's working. And um, so that's sort of the, the, the theory thing and so there were some experiments relatively recently, and uh, these three here, um, that did some first steps in this direction in the sense that they didn't measure a spin, nuclear spin outside of the diamond. They actually just measured the presence of a carbon-13 spin that is sitting near an NB center inside the diamond, which is much easier. But it's still a nice achievement because this this T13 nuclear spin was three nanometers away from the NB center. So not too bad. Um, it's still some way to go, but um, it's sort of looking promising. And now, I mean, we have also in, in the lab in, in Ulm, we have some improvements on this, and it's looking actually quite promising. Right, and I think this is a good place to take a break. So, whatever, I don't know what we agreed, five or ten minutes or yeah, so? Five, ten minutes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit more about, um, well, decoupling methods, tricks, let's say. And uh, then I will show you how you can actually also use diamonds and nuclear spins to build a quantum simulator. And that will probably cover the, the, the second hour, and tomorrow I'll tell you something.